Welcome to the Mulcahy Law Firm Podcast. For over 25 years, Mulcahy Law Firm has helped plan communities and condominium associations throughout the state of Arizona. Please go to iTunes or your favorite podcasting platform and leave us a rating and a review. Thank you for listening. Here's Beth Mulcahy. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our virtual HOA Condo Academy number seven for the month of July, 2023. Today, we're going to be talking about understanding the hierarchy of association documents. We're going to be talking about a five-step plan for amending your CCNRs. And we're also going to be talking about how to, to respond to an owner's record request for documents in the association. So welcome today to our class number seven of our virtual HOA Condo Academy in partnership with the cities of Avondale, Chandler, Glendale, Goodyear, Mesa, Peoria, Phoenix, Scottsdale, Surprise, and Tempe. My name is Beth Mulcahy, and I'm the managing partner and senior attorney of the Mulcahy Law Firm in Phoenix, Arizona. I've enjoyed representing HOAs and condominiums for the past 26 years or over 26 years, actually 27 in November. My firm currently represents over a thousand planned communities and condominium associations throughout the state of Arizona. I also currently serve on my HOA board and have for many years. Before we dive into the meat of the seminar today, I'd like to start off by getting a feel for who's here today so I can tailor the information that I present to best serve all of you who are here in attendance today. So we're going to be doing two polls right now at the same time. So if you're joining us on Zoom, the polls will be on your screen. If you're joining us on Facebook Live, um, well, I would ask that you do is just answer these questions in the comments section. Um, the first question is, which city um, do you reside or which city is your association located in? And then the second question is, um, let us know what your current role is for the association. Are you a board member? Are you a community manager? Are you an interested homeowner or some other relationship to the community? And so we're going to let you answer those two poll questions. Um, and while we're doing that, we're going to talk a little bit about the new legislation. As some of you may know, we always at the beginning of these classes do a little brief summary of what's going on in the Arizona legislature. And just a brief summary is to this is a very unusual year for the Arizona legislature. I can think of maybe only one time in the 25 years and or 25 plus years that I've been monitoring the legislation that the legislature is still in session in July of the year. Remember, our legislature in Arizona is a seasonal legislature. And so typically they're finished by April, May, June at the latest. This year, our uh, legislature is still in session. Right now, they're in recess until July 31st, 2023. And then when they come back, we're not exactly sure what they're going to do. They may try to get a few more bills passed um, and and tie up the session in a week, or they may just open the session and then immediately close it. It's going to be a big question mark on July 31st. So stay tuned. As of right now, we do have five new bills pertaining to HOAs and condominiums in Arizona that have been signed into law by the governor. And what that means is that 90 days after the legislative session ends this year, those bills will go into effect. And so we don't know the exact date that they're going to become the law um, because the session hasn't closed yet for 2023. Of the five bills, we have a great summary that we are going to be sharing with you right now on Facebook Live and also on Zoom. And we also have the same summary listed on our firm's website at mulcahylawfirm.com. So I encourage you to take a look at those five bills. As we get closer to the legislative session ending or the session actually ends, I'm going to spend a little bit of time doing a deep dive on the new legislation and talking through all aspects of it. Most of the bills are pretty self-explanatory. Probably the only bill that's going to require some sort of action is if you are a planned community and your streets have been dedicated to the public, you're going to need to have a vote conducted to determine whether or not you want to continue being able to allow those publicly dedicated streets to have enforcement of parking and speeding, et cetera, on those on those publicly owned streets in a planned community. In the meantime, let's go back and take a look at our poll results. So um, thank you so much for being here today. And it looks like we have a very good representation from almost all the cities that we work with here for these classes. Chandler has 7%, Glendale has 3%, Goodyear has 9%, 
Mesa has 17%, which is a big uptick. Great job, Mesa. Peoria has 7%. Phoenix has 17%. Scottsdale, 29%. Surprise, 4%. And Tempe, 6%. And in terms of our demographics for who's here today, um, 68% of you are board members, 13% are managers, 17% are interested homeowners, and 1% are other. So welcome everybody for being here today. It looks like we have over 113 participants already here today on this hot July day in Arizona. Hopefully some of you are away in cooler locations and some of you are getting away for a break from the heat of the summer at some point. Okay, let's just dive right into um, what we're going to be talking about today. Um, the first subject that we're going to talk about is the hierarchy of association documents. So just as a baseline, what are the documents for an association? We have the plat map for the association, the CCNRs or the declaration, the articles of incorporation, the bylaws, the rules and regulations of the association, maybe architectural guidelines. Oftentimes we're asked, what's the hierarchy or which document is the most important? Or if there is a conflict between the documents, which document controls? And so I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about what each document is and then also what's the hierarchy in case there's any sort of a conflict between the documents, which does happen often, um, surprisingly. Okay, so the hierarchy is pretty simple. I'm just going to do that up front. The plat map is at the top. The CCNRs are second. Articles of incorporation are third. The bylaws are fourth. The rules and regulations are fifth. And then any architectural guidelines you would have would be after that. So plat, CCNRs, articles of incorporation, bylaws, rules, and architectural guidelines. So in the event that there's a conflict, let's say, for example, between the bylaws and the CCNRs, like let's say the bylaws say that the board shall consist of nine members and the CCNRs say that the board shall consist of three members, you always want to go back to the hierarchy and the CCNRs will control because it's higher up in the hierarchy. Um, we have a great cheat sheet on this topic, which I would encourage you to take a look at. We're going to be sharing it with you on Zoom and on Facebook Live, and it talks more about the hierarchy in case you weren't able to write it down as I'm teaching the class here today. Okay, let's talk about, and I'm going to go through what the documents mean in the order of the hierarchy right now. So the plat is the highest document in the hierarchy, and all subdivisions, anytime you have an HOA or a condo subdivision, the plat has to be approved by the city or county that you live in. And then the plat has to be recorded with the Maricopa County Recorder's Office or whatever county's recorder's office that you live in. Um, the plat basically is just a big map and it identifies the lots and units that are going to be subject to um, separate ownership. And also it identifies where the common areas are. So Sometimes you have a, a very few page plat map, or if you have a larger association, it could be, you know, maybe five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten pages. But basically, it's just a map of your association and it outlines where the lots or units are and where the common areas are. And it also talks a little bit about like dedication of the streets, like who owns the streets? Are they part of the common areas or are they being dedicated to the city? It talks about in the key where there may be easements for utilities and other important information regarding the land that the association is situated on. Okay, the next document in the hierarchy is the declaration or the CCNRs. And that is a slang for the Declaration of Covenants, Conditions, and Restrictions. And the CCNRs are the enabling document that creates covenants and restrictions that run with the land and are binding on all owners. So think of it this way. The CCNRs are a contract between the association and the owners. This document is also recorded with the county recorder's office well before the association starts, the developer starts selling the property, the lots or the units. Basically, the declaration outlines the use restrictions for the association, like what owners can and can't do on the property, maintenance responsibilities, who's responsible for maintaining what, the association or the owner, insurance requirements, responsibility to pay assessments, use restrictions on the property, like maybe you're not allowed to run a business out of your home, or you know maybe the 
the highest height of the roof line is defined in the CCNRs. So basically think of the CCNRs as your go-to document when there are questions pertaining to can an owner or the association do something regarding the use and enjoyment of the property. Um, and also as the contractual obligation to pay assessments for owners and for the board to create a budget with those with that assessment income. Okay, the next item in the hierarchy are the Articles of Incorporation. The Articles of Incorporation establish the association as a legal entity with the Arizona Corporation Commission. Now, 99.99% of all associations in Arizona are set up as a nonprofit corporation. And it's very important that you're set up as a nonprofit corporation and that the paperwork is typically filed before any of the lots are sold. It's typically something that's done right at the same time that the CCNRs are recorded and this paperwork is filed with the Corporation Commission. And it basically just sets the association up as a nonprofit corporation. And why is that important? It's important because we don't want any of the owners to have personal liability for any aspect of the association. If there's you know, litigation or if there's a judgment against the association, there's a corporate shield that is placed around the association, the HOA or the condominium association, and it prevents others from piercing that veil and going after the owners in the association or the board members in the association personally. So your personal assets and resources are protected by the association being incorporated as a nonprofit corporation. A good little piece of homework for those of you who are here today would be to go to the Corporation Commission website and um, just Google Arizona Corporation Commission. And um, you can type in the name of your association and do a search to see if you're in good standing with the Corporation Commission. Every year, you have to file an annual report. The board does this, or maybe your management company does this for you with the Corporation Commission. And you pay a small fee. And if you don't do it after a certain number of years, well, after one year, you become in, in bad standing. And then after a few years after that, not doing it, you may be revoked as a nonprofit corporation. And that's a big problem because that corporate shield is now no longer there protecting all of the individual owner's assets. So a little piece of homework would be go to the Corporation Commission website for Arizona type in your association's name and look under the standing provision, whether or not you're in good standing. Um, one other thing that you can do is you can send a reminder, have the Corporation Commission send you a reminder email with, I think it's 30 or 60 days before your annual report is due each year. The Corporation Commission stopped uh, sending paper reminders to file your annual report probably a decade ago. And so you really have to have this on your radar every year that you need to do this. Um, and a good way to get the reminder is to have the Corporation Commission um, send you the reminder email that you have to sign up to do that to get the reminder email each year. Okay, the next um, item in the hierarchy is the association's bylaws. The bylaws are kind of the how to run the association. So it's used for the internal government and operation of the association. Typically, the bylaws will cover how many board members there should be. When is your annual meeting? It will talk a little bit about um, suspension of voting rights, maybe. It will outline the positions of officer. It will talk about just a number of internal organization type things for how your board runs. It also oftentimes talks about the election of directors and how to appoint a director to the board if somebody resigns. And so this is an important document for the internal governance of your association. Okay, the next document is the rules and regulations. Um, and the board is, is usually empowered in the CCNRs or the bylaws to adopt rules and regulations regarding the association's common areas and or behavior of residents within the community. Now, every association has a different set of CCNRs. And so sometimes there's very broad language in the CCNRs about passing rules, like sometimes It'll say that the board can prom promulgate rules regarding any aspect of the association that's pretty broad, or you could have a more limited provision that gives you rulemaking authority. Like the board can only um, promulgate rules regarding um, the owner's behavior on the common areas. And so you have to look at each association's documents to determine um, how broad your rulemaking authority is. 
Okay, so typically what we see with the rules would be, you know, rules regarding maybe the speed limit in the association, pool rules, common area rules, keeping your pets on a leash type rules. Typically, they're about one page. And if your board is creating rules or amending your rules, it's a really good idea to have your association's legal counsel look at them. Because sometimes what some associations do is they try to pass a rule that conflicts with the CCNRs. Like let's say that the CCNRs say that owners are able to rent their property and the board decides, well, we want to have a minimum 30-day rental period in our association. So we're going to pass a rule that says no owner can rent for less than 30 days. Well, that is not something that is legal because that type of a restriction would need to be in the CCNRs. Um, and it also conflicts with what the CCNRs say, because right now the CCNRs allow for unlimited time periods for rentals. And so when you're working on your rules, amendments, definitely run those by your legal counsel for your association, just as a precaution to make sure that you're doing them properly and that it's not conflicting with any other documents. You don't have any language in there that might conflict with the Fair Housing Act um, that could be perceived as discriminatory. And so just a really good idea, practice pointer to make sure you run those by your legal counsel. Um, the next document that we talk about frequently would be like architectural guidelines. Not all associations have guidelines, but some do. And this may be like paint colors for your association, setbacks that are required, building setbacks, really any sort of architectural issue that may impact your association. Like if you're going to change your windows out, what type of windows can be used or what type of roofing material, landscaping requirements possibly for your property. And so again, the architectural guidelines, same thing on, on architectural guidelines, make sure that if you're amending those that you um, are running them by your legal counsel. So that was just a quick little 411 on the documents of the association and their purposes and also the hierarchy for those documents. And again, check out our cheat sheet on what is a community association. And, and we go into a deep dive on this topic and you can share it with your board too. If you're interested in doing that, it's just a great resource for you to use. Okay, let's talk a little bit about our second topic today, which is amending association documents. And one thing that I would recommend here today would be, you know, it's the summer months. Now is a really good time because things seem to slow down and get quieter in our associations in Arizona due to um, the heat. It's a really good time to look at, hey, do our documents need to be updated? Um, and a common question that I get when a client comes to me and asks about amending their documents is, hey, how often should we do it? What's the golden rule on this? Well, there really isn't a golden rule. Well, I, I don't think that you should be amending your documents every few years. I think that's too often, frankly, because it's a big process to amend your documents. But what kind of a rule of thumb that I give most of our clients is about every 10 years, you should be thinking about updating your documents and bringing them up to the standards of whatever the current year is in your association. Really, the most common reasons to amend an association documents are one, that they're outdated, right? I would say that probably 70% of our clients are operating on outdated documents, meaning that the documents were created in the 80s, the 90s, early 2000s, and they haven't done anything to update them. Um, and why is that important? It's important because there are lots of changes in federal and Arizona laws that pertain to associations. Like at the beginning of the presentation today, I mentioned that, hey, there's five new laws. And so every year there have been changes in the law that need to be incorporated into your documents because your documents may conflict with what your current documents state may conflict with what state law says so or federal law says. So good reasons to amend your documents are, hey, we, need it. we haven't done it in the past 10 years and it's time. Um, we need to look at what changes have been made in the law and incorporate those changes. Maybe you're doing things in your association or managing things differently than what your documents say. Like a really good example of this would be parking. A lot of associations have a requirement to enforce on-street parking, and they find it really challenging and difficult to do that um, and expensive if you have to hire a company. And so sometimes the CCNRs say that the board is supposed to be doing it, but the board is actually not doing it. 
um, or they're choosing not to do it. Um, so that would be a good example of something where our documents are inconsistent with what our practices are in managing the association right now. Um, another reason to amend your documents is to get rid of all that developer language. But if your developer is long gone, um, there's really no reason to keep that language in your documents anymore. Just clean up that language, make it easier for the owners to understand and make it less confusing if, if your developer has uh, moved on and um, is no longer um, in control of your association. Um, another reason to amend the documents is to correct any inconsistencies between your bylaws and your CCNRs or your articles and your CCNRs. And so a good reason to do that is to you know make sure that everything is cohesive and the same in terms of the number of directors that are required and other things that might be conflicting in those other documents. And surprisingly, we see a lot of conflicts in documents. That's why it's really important to talk about the hierarchy, which we talked about before, because any document that's higher up in the list is going to be the document that will be controlling in the event of any conflicts. Okay, we have implemented a wonderful five-step plan to help associations with amending their CCNRs. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. Before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about a case that was decided in March of 2022 by the Arizona Supreme Court. This case is getting actually a lot of notoriety in Arizona because it is, it's confusing, frankly, and it is scaring a lot of people into thinking that they cannot amend their association documents anymore because of this case. And then the name of the case is the Callway versus Calabria Ranch. And we're going to be sharing with you the actual opinion on Zoom and on Facebook Live. So if you want to go back and read it after this seminar, you're welcome to do so. And kind of the purpose of me discussing this case is that there's a lot of misinformation and a lot of scare tactics that are being kind of routed around our industry about amendments to CCNRs in light of this case. And I want to just dissect it and talk about just briefly, what it means if you are thinking about amending your association documents. First things first, this case was um, a case out of Tucson, and it was an unusual case in that it was a very small association. It actually was only a five-lot subdivision. And in 2018, what the facts were on this case, um, and again, I'm talking about the Callaway versus Calabria Ranch case, in 2018, Several of the owners, so a few of the five owners, amended the association's CCNRs by a majority vote without the callways, or the plaintiffs in this case, approval or knowledge. So think about it this way. If you, there's a five-person association, and three of the five people team up on the other two you know, owners, and they pass an amendment to the CCNRs without their knowledge and without their being able to vote on it or ask questions or express their displeasure with it. These three owners team up and they pass an amendment to the CCNRs and record it. And the amendment negatively affected the Colways, who are the plaintiffs in this case, and his lot. And his lot was like 23 acres. So he had a, a large lot. The other owners who were teaming up on him and passing the amendment had smaller lots, which were like 3.3 to 6.6 .6 acres. And so they passed something as an amendment to the CCNRs that was detrimental to the callways. And they had the largest amount of land in the community, but they only have their vote. And they weren't even asked to vote on this issue. Okay. So I think one thing that happened here is I think the Arizona Supreme Court was unhappy with the fact that these owners who had the majority of the five lots in the subdivision passed this amendment without letting everybody vote on it and passed an amendment that negatively impacted the callways. And I think it was this opinion was frankly, in my opinion, it was a punishment for the specific facts in this case. So I think that's important for us to just say out loud, you know, the facts really dictated the ruling in this case, in my opinion. Okay, so here's what the Supreme Court said in their ruling. Basically, they said that Arizona courts have the authority to blue pencil CCNRs to eliminate grammatically severable, unreasonable provisions. And so basically what they said in this opinion is, hey, we have a blue pencil, the Supreme Court does, and we can go through any Arizona court, you know, Superior Court, Appellate Court, 
Court of Appeals or the Supreme Court can take this blue pencil and we can just strike through and grammatically sever any unreasonable provisions that we think are unreasonable. And if the court determines that language is invalid, we have the right to do that. The Supreme Court also went on to state that the original declaration in this case um, must give sufficient notice of the possibility of a future amendment. That is, amendments must be reasonable and amendments must also be foreseeable to the owners. Of course, they didn't define, I mean, reasonable is, that's an eye beholder and also foreseeable. They didn't define what they mean by foreseeable. Everybody after reading this case Everybody in the industry, all the lawyers and management companies, we were all kind of just throwing their hands up in the air and saying, what does this mean? This is really kind of crazy to take this small five lot subdivision and say now that the Supreme Court and other courts can strike through any amendment they don't like, that, that they feel is you know unreasonable. And also CCNRs have a provision in it that tells owners that, hey, it's foreseeable that this section could be amended and that the the amendments have to be reasonable. So how do we pivot in light of this Colway case? So some management companies and some attorneys are saying, don't do anything. Don't amend your CCNRs. You can't do anything. You know, you're in a straitjacket on this issue. Our firm, you know, is not taking that position. I think we have to look at the totality of the circumstances on this case um, and the very unique facts And I think we have to be smart on how we approach amendments in light of this case. And so basically what I would say, my best advice is don't overcorrect. Okay, don't just stop doing amendments. This case is going to be clarified in the future by the Court of Appeals or by the Supreme Court of Arizona. And I think that some of the language in this case is going to be further defined so that it will be clear that this doesn't mean that you can't amend your CCNRs ever. And But I do think that we don't want to overcorrect by not doing anything. But I also think that we need to be careful on when we are doing the amendments and how we handle it. And so what we recommend is that if an association is looking at amending their CCNRs, Um, we look to see whether or not um, it's foreseeable that that provision could be amended. One thing to look at is, do you have an amendment provision in your documents? Is it foreseeable that this provision, you know, is going to be amended in light of changes which may have taken place in the law or statutes that may have been been enacted since your last CCNR amendment? And so basically what we do is we analyze, okay, what do you want to change? Uh, What does the client or the association's board want to change? And then we do this reasonable test. And is it foreseeable that this section was going to be amended to the owners? And we have some language that we put in the amendment that helps protect against any potential people that may challenge the amendments based upon the Callaway versus Calabria Ranch. So just I wanted to talk a little bit about that case because I know that there are a number of management companies and attorneys that are saying, hey, don't do anything. You can't amend CCNRs anymore because of this case. And and I think that is an overcorrection. You can still amend your CCNRs, but you just need to be careful how you do it is the bottom line. And talking with your attorney about the reasonableness of the language and the foreseeability of the sections that you want to amend are important topics in that discussion. Let's talk a little bit about our five-step plan. So um, I said earlier in the presentation today that we have been, I have been working with associations for over 25 years. And during that 25-year period, I have done a lot of CCNR and bylaw and rule amendments. And so what I've done is I've taken the knowledge that I have gained over those 25 years, and I've come up with a really effective five-step plan for associations who want to amend their CCNRs. And the plan is a map to success to get your CCNRs amended. Why is it important that you follow the plan? Because CCNR amendments are time consuming and they are expensive, frankly. I mean, somebody always asks me in this presentation, how much does it cost to amend your CCNRs? Well, I I don't know because I haven't seen your CCNRs. I don't know how old they are. I don't know how many pages they are. So I have to look at the documents to give you an estimate. But it's something that you're going to put time and money effort into getting it passed. And so if you're going to do that, you want it to be successful. And this is the five-step success plan to amend your documents. Okay. So the first step is kind of the easiest step in the whole process. And that is 
we need to figure out what is required to amend the documents. So we need to check the specific language of the association's documents. Um, in this five-step plan, just so you know, we have a cheat sheet on this, which if we haven't already, we're going to be sharing shortly with you. If you want to follow along, or you can find it on our website at mulcahylawfirm.com. Okay, so step one, check your documents to determine what is required to amend the documents. So there's typically a provision towards the end of the document in the CCNRs and the bylaws and the Articles of Incorporation that will give us the amendment requirements. So most documents do require a membership vote to amend the documents. So um, the CCNRs you know, are going to require um, a membership vote. The bylaws typically do require a membership vote as well, although occasionally we'll see that the board can amend the bylaws as long as they give notice that they're going to be amending bylaws and the meeting notice and allow people to attend the open board meeting where it's going to be voted on. The articles typically are amended by the membership vote as well. And then, like I said earlier in the presentation, the rules are typically voted on by the board and open board meeting. Okay, so the first thing we want to do, step one, what do we need to amend the documents? We look at the language in the documents. There's an amendment provision. You know, sometimes you need help interpreting the amendment provision because sometimes the language is a little bit unclear. And there is a difference in how it's worded. So you really have to look at the language and think about it. So let's say that the language in your CCNR say that, you know, in order to amend the CCNRs, you need 67% of the votes in the association. And you have 100 votes in the association. That means you'll need 67%, 67 votes, 67% easy with 100. Sometimes it'll say something like you need 67% of those attending the meeting. If you're like a planned community, you may have a provision like that. That means that uh, attending a meeting of the membership. So that means that you have to first get a quorum at the meeting. And then just those who attend in person or by mail-in ballot, you would need 67% of that number. So it is a little confusing. And why it's the first step is because you got to know when you're driving someplace, you got to know the directions, right? And we need to know what number we need to amend each document, Um, whether it's a percentage or an actual number, we need that. Also important to remember that if you're a condominium, there's a special section in the Condominium Act that requires um, that you can't go any lower than 67% of the votes in the condominium to amend the documents. So, you know, you will need 67% of the votes um, to amend um, in a condo. Now, if it's higher, if your CCNRs for your condo are higher, then you go with higher line. But the benchmark, like let's say your condo and your documents say 51% to amend the condominium documents, that conflicts with state law. And so you actually need 67%. So if you're a condo, just a quick recap on that, follow what your documents state for the amendment provisions. If your documents state less than 67%, you got to go up to the benchmark that's state law. For a planned community, there is no benchmark statute. So it's basically whatever your CCNRs say to amend your documents, that's what you go by. Okay, so step one, we're going to figure out what is the requirement, percentage or number to amend our documents. And this is a good time to check in with your attorney, especially if it's confusing language in terms of, hey, do we need 67% of all votes or do we just need 67% of a quorum at a meeting of the membership to amend the documents? Your attorney can help you um, determine what exactly your number is. Okay, step two, this is kind of the longest step maybe the longest or second longest step in the process. So step two is where we come up with the proposed changes that we want to make to the documents. And truly the best way to do this is to put the document into a Word, whatever the document is, CCNRs, bylaws, articles, into a Word document, and then use the track changes function to make changes to the document as you go. I like this because we can keep track of A, who's making the changes, And B, when we send it out to the homeowners later for their input and later than that for their vote, they can see what the original language is and then what the changes are that we're proposing in a red line format. And there's a number of ways that we can do this. I honestly prefer for the board to allow me to um, do the first draft of changes 
to the documents, it's frankly less expensive and easier for me to do the first draft. Basically, we just put the documents into a Word document and then I start making my changes. Another way that some associations do it is they make the changes and then they bring it to me for me to review the changes that they've made. I'm less enthusiastic about that option because sometimes I spend a lot of time undoing the changes that the board has proposed and it's expensive for me and the board to have to undo something. You know, it'd be better for me just to make my changes and then we talk with the board about their changes. It's a little bit more um, efficient in terms of time and it's going to cost you less money in the long run, in my opinion, if you just give the document to your attorney first, let them make their changes. And then we give the document to the board and then they review my changes and they may come up with their own changes. Um, And I take a look at those at that point before they make them. I will typically say, well, what do you propose or what would you like to do? Maybe send me an email with a listing. And then if something isn't going to work, I just write back to them and say, hey, this violates the law or this can't do this because of this, this, and this, or, or actually implement them into the final document. Again, step two, it's important that you have your legal counsel involved during this step to help you write up the changes to the amendments to the CCNRs, because we want to make sure that whatever you're proposing is going to be considered reasonable by a court, right? Light of the Cowley case. But then also that it's consistent with what Arizona law currently says or what federal law currently says. Okay, step three is the next step. So step one, just to recap, what does it take to amend the documents? What's the percentage? Um, step two, we make our changes to the documents. Step three, this is the step that everybody wants to skip. But this is the step that I can tell you after practicing in this area for over 25 years, This is the step you need to do. And this step is to take those changes that we came up with in step two and send them out to the homeowners and ask for their input, not their vote. This is just your input. Send a cover letter to the owners, say the board has been working on some amendments to the CCNRs or the bylaws. And we want your input on them so that we can make sure that we've got a good pulse on how the homeowners feel about these amendments. Um, And so during step three, we educate and solicit community support of the proposed changes, and we receive feedback from the owners about how they feel about it. Now, we typically will send out like a comment card with the amendments, or if you're doing it electronically, we send the documents electronically and to all owners, and we ask them to email back any comments or suggestions that they may have on the changes. Now, truth be told, you'll be lucky if you get 5 or 10% of the owners that take the time to look at the documents and give feedback. But the people that do take the time to give you the feedback, they will be a window to how the other owners will be feeling about the amendments. So, If you hear feedback, um, and we typically only give like 30 days to give the feedback. If you're hearing negative feedback about implementing a rental restriction or maybe giving the board more authority to raise the assessments to a higher percentage, it's important for us to hear that feedback because it likely will be widespread negative feedback when this goes out for a vote, the ballot. And so hearing this feedback at this stage where we can still make some strategy changes is really helpful. So step three, you know, is the time to hear back from our owners that are willing to, to look at it and give us their thoughts and get the word out that, hey, we're doing an amendment to the CCNRs. We want your input. Please get back to us with your feedback. Okay, step four now is we take that feedback that we get from the owners and we strategize. We have a powwow. I'm typically involved with my client, the board, and we're looking at the feedback together in real time, maybe on a Zoom meeting, maybe on a conference call, and we're strategizing. Okay, we got a lot of negative feedback on you know this particular section in the amendments. Should we toss it out altogether? Or should we maybe separate that and vote on that separate from the yes or no vote to amend the entire document? Um, And so we do a little strategy thoughts on that at this time. And because the worst thing that could happen would be that we send out the amendment as a yes or no vote for the amending the entire document. And people are upset about that one thing and they vote no because of that one thing. And I want to avoid that pain because that will cause the amendment to tank. 
So we really strategize in step four about how can we effectively get the most amendments passed that we're proposing in light of the feedback that we receive from the owners. At this point, you know, in addition to coming up with what the final language is going to be for the amendment and maybe segregating um, and separating the vote on a controversial topic or maybe even tossing out that topic, we also come up with what was going to be our plan and a reasonable time frame for the owners to vote on this issue. So at this point, we'll come up with our final ballot. We'll come up with the final language that we plan to use in the actual amendment document. We'll write a cover letter asking people to please vote by a certain date. And we'll also kind of plan out how long we think it's going to take to get the vote. Now, some associations say, hey, we can get this done in 30 days and they know their community best. You know, that's fine. We can put a 30 day leash on this for them to to get back. Um, But more likely than not, I'm recommending when we're strategizing on this to do, you know, somewhere between 90 days or maybe even six months. Um, And I always put in the, the ballot language that the time period to return the ballot can be extended by the board at any time during an open board meeting. So if let's say we get to the 90 day mark and we're so close, we're only three votes away and we don't have it, the board can just vote at a regular board meeting to extend it to, you know, make it a longer time period so we can get those votes that we need. Okay, then step five, you've gone through the whole process now. You've sent the ballot out to the owners. You've um, given them the language that's being amended. You're getting the ballots back. We're counting them. At a certain point, we, you know how we count them is we typically have an Excel spreadsheet and we have all owners' names listed on it. And we just start uh, monitoring who's voted, who hasn't voted. Um, for people who have not voted, we continue to follow up with them to vote, whether it's a yes vote or a no vote. We don't care. It's just we're asking you, please, to vote on this amendment. And then the, the final step is at a certain point, you're going to hit the threshold number that you need. And once you hit that threshold number or percentage that you need of yes votes to amend the documents, then we need to record the amendment with the Maricopa County Recorder's Office or whatever county your association is located in. And then that document becomes the final recorded document that you know shows all the amendments to the association's documents. Just a practice pointer here. Once you get that threshold percentage that you need, we only have 30 days, and this is 30 calendar days, to record that amendment under the law. So we really want to keep track of those ballots as they're coming in on a spreadsheet so that we know once we hit that threshold vote so that we can you know, record the amendment with the county recorder's office. Okay, what are some um, common problems with CCNR amendments that I want to talk about real quickly? Well, first, be careful in determining what percentage vote is required. We talked about that in step one already. Make sure you're talking with your legal counsel so that you're aiming for the correct number um, based upon what your documents state. Second thing is we never use a secret ballot for CCNR amendments. So um, you may use secret ballot for election of directors uh, or voting on issues maybe at your annual meeting, but the CCNR amendments are not typically something that is a secret ballot is used for. Make sure you give your owners enough time to return the ballots. So when you're strategizing in step four, give them plenty of time to return it because sometimes when there's something that's difficult to read or long to read, people put it aside and they may not vote on it as fast as they would like a ballot for election of directors where they just, you know, check the box for who their candidate is, a candidate is that they want to vote for. So make sure when we're in step four that we're strategizing about how much time we really need to return the ballots and make sure it's a reasonable amount of time to give people the best opportunity to return the ballot. Another thing that's important is when we return the ballots, make sure that the record owner signs the ballot and it's not a renter or a non-record owner signing the ballot. We need to have whoever's on the deed, they are the ones that can legally sign the ballot, can only count that ballot Yes, the record owner signs it. And then last but not least, remember you have 30 days, calendar days after that ballot amendment passes to get that amendment recorded with the county recorder's office. Okay, let's briefly talk a little bit about rental restriction amendments. This is like a very popular topic. There's been a dramatic increase in the amount of or the number of rental properties in Arizona. I think having the Super Bowl and 
spring training and um, our sports teams bring a lot of people to Arizona as tourists, as well as our great weather. And so a lot of associations don't like the nightly rentals in their association or the bachelorette week or whatever. So basically what um, associations come to me and they say, well, can we, our CCNRs have no restriction on rentals. So it doesn't say that there's a minimum time period to rent or it doesn't prohibit rentals. Um, and under Arizona law, if your documents don't have a restriction on rentals, there are no restrictions on rentals and people can rent daily, nightly, whatever, weekly, monthly. And that's just the way that our law is structured. Um, and so if you're thinking about doing a rental restriction amendment, a couple of things that I would give you some recommendations. Number one, you definitely want to get your legal counsel for your association involved and make sure that they're helping you write the amendment. We need to look at how many rentals you currently have in the association. So let's say that you currently have 50% of your association is rentals and you need 67% to implement you know, a minimum rental period. It may be really difficult to get 67% in light of the fact that you have 50% of your demographics are already renting and they may not want to change anything about their rentals. And so it's a good strategy. Like I strategize with the boards about, okay, is this even feasible? Is this even feasible based upon the demographics in your association that we can get the yes vote? Maybe should we do it through a grandfather clause where we grandfather all owners that are currently renting, or maybe all owners, period. And they can rent um, restricted, but any new owner who moves in is going to be subject to these CCNRs. So there are a number of strategy things that we, we can talk about if you're trying to implement a rental restriction. If you're a condominium, there's a heightened analysis that we need to do because we can't change the use of the property without 100% approval of the membership. And so we need to determine is the amendment that we're trying to implement for rental restrictions, is it a change of use? Like, are we trying to prohibit rentals where they've been allowed before? And how can we potentially structure that so that if somebody challenges this, that we win and we, we prevail in a court of law? We have a great cheat sheet that I, I'd like you to take a peek at. The, the back side of the cheat sheet that we gave you on five-step plan for amending CCNRs has a great rental restriction amendment summary of the whole process, what state law says, what you can and can't do. So I encourage you to take a look at that. I also would encourage you, if you have a lot of rental properties in your community and maybe you're having problems with them, maybe you're not, we have a great cheat sheet um, on our website too that's called How to Effectively Work with Rental Properties. And that just outlines what type of information can you ask from um, the landlord owner to be in compliance with Arizona law, what remedies do you have if the landlord owner has a bad tenant in the property, et cetera. So I encourage you to take a look at that. And we're going to be sharing that on Zoom and Facebook Live here today too. Okay. So we've covered a lot of topics here today. Our last topic we're going to talk about is records requests. So how do we handle records requests from an owner? What's the typical back pattern that we see for a records request? First, I want to just let you know that we have a great publication that does more of a deep dive on this. It's our top 10 cheat sheet, top 10 things you need to know about community association law. Number 10 on that cheat sheet is records requests. So we're going to be sharing that with you on Facebook Live and on Zoom here. So you can take a look at that. Okay, what's the fact pattern that we typically see when we have an owner who is requesting records? Typically, the owner's upset about something. They're unhappy that their architectural review form was denied for a playground. And they want to look at lot five and lot 10 because they have a playground. And I don't know why they're allowed to have it and I'm not allowed to have it. So they want to make a records request for everything in, in the lot files for those other lots. Typically, it's unhappy, disgruntled owners who are making records requests. And the typical fact pattern is we get an email of saying either from the owner's attorney or from the owner themselves saying, I want to see these records. A couple of things to think about. Number one, if the owner makes a large records request, like I want 20 years of meeting minutes, 20 years of bank statements, 18 years of you know, the financials for the association. Um, and it's going to take a lot of time, effort, and management company time or board member time to look up this information. 
a strategy that I typically implement will be that I will pick up the phone, give, give me the, the problem. So hand it over to your attorney. And what I will do is I will pick up the phone and I will call the owner and I'm going to talk with them, find out what's upsetting them. Why are they upset? And what specifically, what is the information that they specifically want to find out? And then I help them with what documents specifically they should request. Um, And why is this a smart idea? It's a smart idea because coming up with 20 years of documents is going to take a ton of time. And it's not really going to get them the answer that they need, right? It's just going to, it's going to be an avalanche of paper that we have to go through And then it's going to be an avalanche paper that they have to go through and everybody's going to be leaving there feeling frustrated and upset. So I pick up the phone when someone makes a records request and it's a large one. And I say, I listen to them and I listen to them complain about whatever issue they're upset about. And then I ask them, what are you looking for in the documents? What smoking gun, what information do you want that will help you um, better understand something? And, you know, then they tell me and then I say, okay, if I were you, this is what I would request. I'm not your attorney, but you want this information. This is where this information can be found and help them recraft the records request. And lots of times it goes from like 5,000 pages of paper that they requested down to three sheets of paper. And it is a much more efficient way to handle things. Okay. That being said, what's the law on records requests? So remember that under Arizona law, owners have a right under the Condominium Act and the Planned Communities Act to basically look at almost all records of the association. So Associations should not be playing hide the ball or they can't have that because basically like 95% of all association records are fair game for the owners to ask to see. And they can ask to make a copy of it. So if they want to see a record, they can ask you to make a copy of it. The association can charge 15 cents a page for that copy or the owner can just ask to see um, the actual original document and can't charge if they just want to see the original document. Um, a couple of things come up sometimes that I just want to talk about because these things come up. So if I'm getting a, if we're doing a records request on behalf of a client and the client sends me a financial statement that the owner requested by email, I just pop it right to the owner by email and I don't charge them 15 cents per page. You know, I think. Sometimes boards will say charge them because otherwise they'll continue to make these, you know, really large records requests. Maybe that's a consideration. I think it's best just to be nice and just give it to them and that electronically. I mean, if you have to actually make the copy, then yes, I agree. We, we charge them the 15 cents per page. But if it's coming to me electronically, I just push it out, get it to them, and we don't charge them typically. What are some records that you cannot have if you're an owner in an association under the law? So you cannot have privileged communication between an attorney for the association and the association. So any sort of writing that's privileged between the association and their attorney, you can't have. Anything pertaining to pending litigation, so litigation that is open um, regarding the association, you can't have. You cannot have executive session meeting minutes, right? Because you're not allowed to be in executive session as an owner unless you're on the board. So you can't have the meeting minutes. You also can't have any records. These next two ones are kind of, we don't see as often, but I'm going to mention anyways. You can't have, cannot have personal health or financial records about an individual member of the association, an individual employee of the association, or an individual employee of a contractor for the association. So how often does an association have personal health or financial records on these persons, the owners, employees, or independent contractors? Not very often, but there are times like emails would be considered a personal information of an owner. Telephone numbers would be considered personal information and owners can't have that. Social security number, bank accounts, canceled checks, that's all going to be considered personal information. I do not personally believe, it's my opinion, that an owner's lot file has personal information in it, meaning like architectural approvals. I think those are fair game. Or architectural disapprovals. The last category is that owners also cannot have any records pertaining to the job performance of, compensation of, health records of, or specific complaints against employees of the association or independent contractors of the association. 
And so if you can't have complaints, you know, where there's either complaint letters about the contractor or the employee or et cetera. I oftentimes will get asked the question, well, what about the management contract? Is that fair game? I think it is. The association has to, or I know it is, the association has to give the management contract or any contract vendor contract that you have to the owner. You can redact the compensation under this section that allows us to you know, withhold anything pertaining to compensation of a contractor. However, why would you? Because there are so many other places that the owner can see it. So on the budget, on the financial statement, in the check register. So be practical. You certainly have the right to redact it, blacken out how much you're paying them, but it's probably going to raise a lot more questions and it's going to make it look like we're hiding something. And it can be easily found looking in other places, the budget, the financials of the association, the check register, et cetera. So don't play hide the ball on that. It just doesn't make sense. Okay. So just kind of in conclusion on this records request thing, remember one final thing that we cannot charge the owner for the time it takes to put together the records for the records request. So that cannot be passed through to the owner. We can charge 15 cents per page for any copies we make. If the management company is preparing the records and they charge for that typically pursuant to their management contract, the association has to pay that charge to the management company pursuant to the contract that they have with the management company. We cannot pass that charge for making the books and records available or pulling the records onto the owner. That's really important. The last thing that's very important is once an owner makes a written request to see records, we have 10 business days to provide those records to the owner. So the day that that records request comes in, you want a calendar that you need to respond within 10 10 calendar days to that records request. If you have a very large records request and you cannot get the documents together in 10 days, immediately contact the owner as soon as the records request comes in and get it in writing that we received your records request. We need 30 days because we have to go to offsite storage to get the records or whatever. Just document why you need more than the 10 business days. And courts will find that if you immediately respond and you have good reason that they're going to be more lenient on that 10 business day time period to get the records to the owner. But in the meantime, any records that are part of that request that you can make available you know, within the 10-day business period, you should do that. And then if you need a little longer to go to storage or whatever, that's fine. One last thing, how do you handle something if an owner is requesting something that doesn't exist or that used to exist, but it's maybe been destroyed because it's so old? Just tell the truth. It doesn't exist. We don't have that in our records and why. We also have a great blog on how to handle records requests by owners, which I would encourage you to take a look at in addition to our top 10 cheat sheet. Okay, it looks like we're, it's 1203 and we have about 24 questions. So for those of you who might be joining me for the first time, at the end of every um, Neighborhood Services HOA Academy, virtual HOA Academy, we answer every question that has been submitted throughout the class. And so today we have 24 questions. The first question is, boards and management company doesn't respond to co-owner requests for vendors' contracts or four formal email requests made for three months. No responses or acknowledgement of request. What is the recourse for owners? Okay, basically make sure you're document, documenting in writing that you're requesting these records. And apparently they don't want to give the vendor contract. I think it's probably what's going on here. What you can do is when you make your records request, what you may want to do is say, I understand that you know you can redact the compensation of, of the contractor and you're welcome to do that on the contract I'm requesting, but I want to see the actual terms of the contract. Tell them that you've made all these requests. If you don't respond, you can either file a lawsuit against them in Superior Court, or you can go to the Arizona Department of Real Estate and file a complaint um, against the association. And then there will be a hearing with an administrative law judge. If you want more information on that complaint process, you just Google Arizona Department of Real Estate and HOA and condo disputes, and the whole process will come up um, if you click on the link. Okay, can an HOA charge a 1% transfer fee when selling a condo? If yes, how? Okay, great, we have a cheat sheet on this exact topic. 
Um, it's called Disclosure and Transfer Fees. Um, so I would encourage you to take a look at this. We're going to be sharing it on Zoom and Facebook Live here right now. The bottom line is, yes, they can charge this, but they have to comply with the requirements under Arizona law. And it has to be in the CCNRs, and there's um, a very specific way that it needs to be written. So unless your association has that specific language in your CCNRs allowing you to do this, it may not be enforceable. Okay, question number three. What hanging signage around a private condominium complex? When hanging signage around a private condominium complex, is it prudent to use both English and Spanish language? I guess it really just depends on the demographics in your association. And has there been a request for the signage to be in English and Spanish? Some associations do it. I would say it's irregular, though. I mean, I think it's more likely than not most of the signs are in English, but some associations also have you know, the Spanish signs because they want everybody to know what the rules are. And if you have a large Spanish-speaking demographic, that might be a good idea for your community. So it's prudent if you have a large demographic and your board's okay with that. Okay, next question. Have you ever heard of someone trying to change a plat map of an association? Is that something that is even possible to do? Yes, I have. Um, in fact, our firm has helped uh, a number of associations over the years amend the plat. It's not easy to do, but it can be done. Um, it requires a vote of the membership. Um, typically, it's the same vote that's the amendment provision in your CCNRs. And you also have to go through, um, you may, depending on what the amendment is, you may need to use an engineering company to recreate the plat map. And you likely will also need to go through, uh, you know, approval from whatever city approved the original plan. Question number five, if a board member still owns a home in an HOA, but is living in another area, can they still participate in board votes and be on the board? So yes, about seven or eight years ago, there was a law that was passed by the Arizona legislature that said it, you cannot make a requirement to be on the board that you live on the property. So, you know, even as long as they own a home in the property and they're the record owner, they still can serve on the board. Again, this would be a good question for our blog too, that for our firm. And uh, I know my team's listening to this here today. So I would recommend that we, we do that because that's a, a good question that comes up often. Okay, number six, where is the plat map located? How can association members obtain a copy or view the plat map? So the best way to do it, the best way to find it, it's listed on the Maricopa County Recorder's Office. If you live in Maricopa County or whatever county recorder that you live in, a couple different ways you can do it. The way I do it, to be perfectly honest with you, is I go to uh, the assessor's office, Maricopa County Assessor's Office, and I type in the address of an owner for the property. And once the owner's information comes up, there's an area that shows the plat map that's associated with that property. I click on that and then it automatically directs you to the recorder's office. You can use a title company to get the plat map if that you can't get it, if you're unsuccessful in figuring that out. You can go to the recorder's office website and look up by the association's name too. So where is it located? It's always recorded with the county recorder's office. You can obtain a copy of it through clicking on a link at the assessor's office for a property that's located in the association. You can go to the county recorder's office to get it, or you can have a title company get it for you. Okay, number seven, can the board create landscape rules without homeowner input or architectural committee input? That's a really good question. There's a weird tension between the board and typically the architectural committee. And it's just a weird thing that I've noticed over the years. Try not to be that way if you can, um, because we're all a team. And when you're volunteering either as a board member or as a committee member, we're all working together. So, I mean, I think it would be smart for the board to let the architectural committee know that they're thinking about making these changes and get their feedback, but they aren't technically required to do so. Can the board create it? Yes, they can create landscaping rules without the input, but is it a good idea? No. Best practices would be to have everybody at the table, including the owners, have publicized that you're thinking about changing it and get their feedback too. Okay, question eight. We had a board that had an issue with a vendor. The vendor placed a lien on all of our homes. Should we have been protected against this by the Articles of Incorporation? 
Okay, so this sometimes happens. There's construction liens that are placed on properties when the association is engaging in a large construction project. And so it may have been unavoidable. So sometimes when there's a large construction project that the association is working on, as protections for the contractor to get paid, they will send you a copy of a lien and the lien is send the association a copy of the lien and the lien is their protection in the case that the association doesn't pay. Now, I've seen this come up in weird situations where maybe like the developer didn't pay their contractors while they were in control of the board and then they left and then, you know, the contractor's coming back to get paid and trying to exercise their rights under the lien. And so I guess the question is, should we have been protected as owners against this? I mean, if it's the standard lien that's done before a large construction project, there is nothing really that the board can do about it. It's, you know, it's a pre-lien. It's not even recorded. If it's the type of lien that actually gets recorded because the board or the developer didn't pay some bill, then yes, you should have been protected. That is unusual and that should not have happened. And you need to go to your board and say, you need to rectify this immediately. And it, to me, it would be a sign that the, your board is not acting appropriately or that they don't have the funds or whatever. There might be a backstory on it or they don't know what to do because it's a developer expense. So your board should be talking with their attorney to figure out what the best plan is here. Question number nine, our previous board members neglected the perimeter walls for numerous years. We, the current board, decided to paint and walked the walls and found stucco cracks and erosion, which caused the exposure of the bare block below original grade level. We received estimates of $11,000 to repair this. The plat states the HOA has the responsibility of maintenance of perimeter walls. Our attorney states that we can charge the owner homeowners instead of taking it out of reserve or funds. Wouldn't we be asking for trouble or a lawsuit if we do this? This is one of those where I really need to kind of look at all the documents and to know more about the facts. But if the association has a responsibility for maintenance of it, first glance, I don't do not think that you can force owners to repair whatever, maintain the perimeter walls. But there are exceptions to that. For example, maybe this wall isn't a perimeter wall. Maybe this is like a party wall between two areas and it's not the definition of a perimeter wall or maybe the owner overwatered and created the cracks and the erosion issue and they're at fault and because of that you know we have a contractor that says hey they caused this and there's a provision in the documents that says if you damage something as an owner you're responsible for it so i don't know all the facts on this one so it's hard for me to comment on it um, but you definitely should ask some of the questions that I raised here today to your board and to your board's attorney. Okay, question number 10. How long does the corporation have to respond to document requests and other information? So once it's placed in writing, the records request, you have 10 business days to respond with the documents to the owner. Okay, question number 11. We have a large number of units owned by LLCs as rental units. When holding votes, right now we are attempting to amend our CCNRs, are the LLCs given voting rights? So yes, they are. Um, They're given voting rights just as any other owner would be. You're just going to want to make sure that the manager of the LLC is the person that's voting on the amendment. And you can find out who the manager is of a corporation or an LLC manager of an LLC, or if it's a corporation, a shareholder or director of the corporation, um, by going to the Arizona Corporation Commission and looking up the name of the entity. And it'll be listed right there who the manager or the director is for that association and for that particular LLC or corporation. And then that person should be allowed to vote. Okay, next question. Number 12, can a board make a rule or guideline that is not supported by the CCNRs regarding the Architectural Control Committee? Specifically, can the board suddenly decide that they are going to charge a $10,000 deposit for any major reconstruction? For the past 30 years, there was never a construction deposit required. We have a cheat sheet that talks about this that I would like you to take a peek at. It's on the Architectural Control Committee. 
And you should look at that because the law was amended several years ago, talking about new construction and what the board, um, you know, the specific procedure that the board can follow regarding new construction properties and the type of deposits that they can charge. But generally speaking, this is really something that needs to be in the CCNRs. So I need to know more about the specific rule that they have put in place. Um, I'd need to see your CCNRs to see if maybe it gives the board the authority to do this, but maybe it doesn't list the amount. So it's hard for me to comment on this without actually seeing more information. But it's possible that in light of the legislation that was passed, that they are you know, now implementing a deposit. But I, I want to see what your documents say about this. Okay, question number 13. If language is not included in our CCNRs to restrict smoking on patios, can we add it to the rules and regulations? It really depends on how broad your rulemaking authority is for your association. So, and are the patios considered limited common elements? It sounds like possibly you're a condominium or a townhome. And so I think it's likely you're able to do this, but you need to have um, something in your documents that would support this. So broad rulemaking authority would be number one and then implement the correct language in the actual rules by a voting membership, excuse me, by the board of directors, um, typically is going to be the entity that can amend the, the rules and regulations. Okay, question number 14. Our board has been having weekly board of directors working group meetings. The meetings are posted and minutes are taken. Recently, it was decided that we could vote on issues and share the results at the next monthly meeting. Is this ethical? Okay, it really just depends. You're saying that your meetings are posted. So if the meetings are posted 48 hours in advance of the meeting and you're taking minutes and owners are getting an agenda, which is a requirement to have an open meeting um, when they come to the meeting or before the meeting, that's fine. But you need to define it in the meeting notice that, hey, this is the board of directors working group. And we'll be discussing items, but we also vote on issues at this board of directors working group. Okay, next question. Um, number 15, how much does it generally cost to update our CCNRs and bylaws? Also, if they are updates, do the updated CCNRs require an approval vote of the community like an amendment, or can the board just approve the new documents? Okay, so how much does it generally cost to update the CCNRs and bylaws? This is a really great question to lead into something that our firm offers, um, which is a free 15-minute review of any of your documents that you want us to review. We will you know, look at all of them at once. We'll spend 15 minutes on it for free. And then we'll give you what our very quick general ideas are on how to amend them and what the amendment requirements are, so what percentage you need. And then we'll also give you a, a bid for approximately how much it's going to cost to amend your CCNR. So I can't give you a general, you know, I've seen some that are as low as 1,000. I've seen some that are as high as 10,000. It really just depends on a number of different factors, how old they are, how long they are, how many changes need to be done, how structurally they're set up, are they set up well, are they not set up well, how many back and forths. You know, meetings do I have with the board on the amendment? All of these things will factor into the total cost. And do updated CCNRs require a membership vote? We have to look at the documents to determine, but 99.99%, you are going to need a vote of the membership in order to amend your CCNRs. Okay, question 16. Are HOA records available to all members to see and are copies of these documents free? The management copy billed me for copies of last year's tax returns at 15 cents a page. So it's free for you to view them. If you just go in and look at the document, the original, but if they, if you ask for a copy, it's 15 cents per page under state law. So your management company was correct in to handle it that way as long as you got the copy of the document. Okay, question number 17. How does a planned development district relate to the plat for a particular subdivision? I'd have to look at the plat for your particular association. And I'm not quite sure what you mean by planned area development district. Um, I'm assuming some associations have, you know, they're set up by the developer and approved by the city in a certain way. And I'm guessing you're one of those where it's like a district, but without seeing the specifics of your association, I'm sorry, I can't comment on this one. If you email me offline, um, I'll take a look at it for you, okay? 
Okay, next question, number 18. Our governing documents are 25 years old, 25 plus years old. We have begun the process of amending all of them that started only with the Articles of Incorporation presented to the owners. Our articles require 75% approval by the owners for amendments by a written consent, not a vote. We have not made such headway in getting approvals. We have not made much headway in getting approval since April. We have written two letters to owners explaining why amendments are necessary. For example, to eliminate obsolete developer language. We have explained specifically that any changes to the articles do not affect the CCNRs. Can you suggest a way to overcome apathy or resistance to the changes? Well, a couple things. I think that you should, I mean, it looks like you sent the documents out, you know, in April, it's July. I mean, I would probably do about every, a reminder every week or every two weeks that people need to vote on it and that we will continue to contact you until there is a vote by you on this. That's one way to handle it. Also talk about it at your annual meeting, add it to the ballot for your annual meeting. So when they're voting for candidates, they also vote on this if they haven't voted already. Phone calls, having a coffee at the park where we ask people to come, or maybe have like a community bonding event and have the ballots there, the, the written consents there so people can vote on it. I mean, you really do have to get creative. You're in that step four, you're between four and five, but I'm not sure how much strategy you had in step four to get that 75% approval. Like I would have already mapped it out saying, okay, it's going to be hard to get 75% approval. This is hard. That's a high number. So every week we're going to send an email to those who haven't voted. And every month we're going to break out the people that haven't voted. And we're going to, as a board, we're going to divide up the names and we're going to call the people who haven't voted. And we're going to have a social event at the park and we're going to bring the written consents to that. And they, who hasn't voted, if we see them there, we're going to track them down and get them to vote. These are all different examples of how to get the votes. But the key thing is squeaky wheel gets it done. You got to just it's blood, sweat and tears at the end, try to get these votes. You have to just continue to contact them and let them know we're going to continue to contact you until you vote yes or no on this. Okay, next question. In the past, I think you've said that there are a number of practical provisions you believe should be considered when amending CCNRs, like prohibiting a husband and wife from serving on the board concurrently. Can you discuss your most common suggestions? I need like an hour to do that. <laughs> but the probably the most, okay, of course, yes, the example you gave, it's never a good idea to have a husband and wife serving on the board at the same time. That would be a good practical one. Some other ones would be when we're making changes to the like the law for an amendment to the CCNRs per se or an amendment to the bylaws. I've been putting a provision in there that says that any time the Arizona legislature amends any law that conflicts with this document, that the board can automatically record an amendment bringing the document into compliance with the changes in the law. That's probably the best one because that gives you bulletproof for the future. You don't have to go back and get membership approvals for these future amendments that happen and their future law changes that happen. You can just go ahead and the board can just go ahead and do it. So I think that's probably the biggest practical one that I can talk about. Another few ones I can think of would be like, if your annual meeting is like honed into like one day each year, you have to have it on the first Monday of February at 9 p.m. or whatever. I mean, I think we all can recognize that that hasn't always been followed in an association for a number of reasons. Um, and so changing that to make it more lenient that you just have to have it within the fiscal year. Okay, next question. This question is related to the Callway case that we talked about in the presentation. Callway versus Calabria Ranch. If an association documents prohibit the association giving any HOA funds to a third party, is it foreseeable that an amendment could allow the association to give funds from the HOA dues and assessments to a third party that is a for-profit corporation under the general amendment provision? Probably not, actually, but I don't know enough about the facts. Are you like acquiring land or are you, is this like a contract type of thing? I, I, I'm not sure I really understand where you're going on this. So you're paying a third party you can't give HOA funds to a third party. I'm not even sure that that was quoted properly for what your documents say, because typically you do give money to a third party. You pay all your vendors, et cetera. 
So I, I'm going to have to pass on this question. Email me with clarification because I don't understand what you're asking. Okay, next question, number 21. You designate a community as a planned community versus an HOA, which sometimes follows different rules. I live in what I imagine is under a planned community. Is it the size or what are the parameters? Okay, so great question. Sorry, I didn't clarify that sooner. So Arizona law defines whether you're a planned community or a condominium. If you're a condominium, and one of the kind of the easiest ways to do it, and we have a deep dive on this on the cheat sheet that we shared in this presentation on what is an association, it defines what's the difference between a condo and a planned community from a legal perspective. Okay, in a condo, from a legal perspective, the owners own a percentage interest in the common areas. If you look at your deed and it says you own unit two and one forty-ninth of the common areas, you are a condo. Another place to look in the CCNRs if it says that the common areas or the common elements of the association are owned in percentage by the owners in percentage based upon their ownership, then you're a condo. A planned community, on the other hand, the common areas are owned by the association's board of directors or the association. Condo, the owners own a percentage interest in the common areas. Planned community, the association owns the common areas and we get taxed on the common areas. We get taxed over the property. That's probably the simplest way to, that's the way I do it typically. Occasionally, it's confusing. Like it'll say one thing like that the, sometimes it'll have both, like, and you're not quite sure what it is. Um, and that's when you escalate it to an attorney to determine, help you determine which one it is. Okay, number 22, does step four in our amendment process have to occur in an open meeting session? Yes, unless your attorney is present or unless your attorney is giving you advice on this and it falls under the category advice from your legal counsel that you could push it to executive sessions. Um, number 23, does your five-step plan vary when elective voting is used? No, doesn't. Most of our clients actually now are using electric voting, um, whether owners are returning the ballot by email or sometimes we're using a company like HOA Vote now and they just handle the whole balloting for an association. So no, it doesn't change. Step four or five doesn't change. It's just part of the strategy process that, okay, we're going to be collecting the ballots this way, or we're going to be giving the owners the opportunity to vote electronically by email or maybe through a company, a third-party company to help us with the vote. Okay, can we charge 15 cents for electronic copies? That is the question of the day, right? I gave my example that I personally do not charge for that when I am given an email, you know, and I forward copies of documents by email and I forward it to the homeowner by email, I don't charge for it. I think from a practical perspective, if you're handing them a actual copy, a physical copy, then I would charge them for it. If it's electronic, I think you're in a gray area and I don't think you win if this goes to court. Another thing that I just want to mention because I've had this come up a few times uh, over the years is that somebody comes to my office, let's say, to do a records review. Um, they're an owner. They've requested records. The board's asked me to meet with the owner to make sure they don't steal the records, frankly, if we put them in a conference room. And the owner sits in there and takes pictures using their phone on the records. And my client is typically going absolutely berserk because they don't want them doing that. If there's a protocol for records reviews when they're only reviewing the records and they're not asking for copies, that needs to be established before you go into the room with the owner. And so if the protocol is, and this should be voted on the board meeting, no phones, no copy machines can be brought in, etc. You need to st tell them that up front when you tell them where they can come to review the records, make sure you make that clear. And the board should have that as a policy that's been voted on as open board meeting if that's what you want. Then the follow-up question on this is, what about for 300 pages of electronic copies? Well, I mean, there's no requirement that you, you know, have to send it electronically. As a matter of fact, somebody who's requesting 300 pages, I wouldn't make it that easy for them because that's like a really large records request. I probably would just print it out and tell them they can pick it up and charge them 15 cents per page on that. I have a funny story. I have very little time. We're almost to the conclusion that I do. I do kind of like to tell the story because it really is hilarious. So earlier in my career, I was helping an association do a records request for a very difficult owner in the community. 
And this particular owner was also kind of odd, truth be told. And so we had somebody in our office watching the person in our conference room. We have a glass conference room at that time and a glass door. And so we had the position just so that we could watch them as they were going through the documents. And my office called back to me and said, I think the person who was in there for the records request just put one of the documents in his pants. <laughs> what should I do? And I said, well, I'll be down. I'll come down to the conference room and I'll talk with them. And, you know, so I said to the person, we have somebody watching you and they told me that you put the document in your pants and you can't do that. Obviously, these are the originals. If you want a copy of it, I'm happy to make a copy of it for 15 cents per page. And I'm going to give you, you know, like three minutes to turn around and get it out and put it on the table or I'm going to call the police. And so hilarious, the guy, you know, he's, oh, I didn't do that. It's not in my pants, and, you know, whatever. And then the next thing I knew, he turned around, got it out of his pants and put it back on the table. And so you really do have to watch. It was actually hilarious at the time. And he didn't stay much longer either. Truth be told, he got out of there quick. So I must have embarrassed him by making him do that. But Watch the documents. If you are in a, if somebody's coming into the management company's office or to the board's clubhouse or to your attorney's office to review the records, it is possible that you're going to be involved in litigation on this. And if they lift something and take our original document, we don't have it anymore. So you really do need to have somebody kind of babysitting, watching what's going on to make sure that they're not stealing original documents. So Okay, that's it for today. Just a few concluding remarks. A few things to mention. We had 127 live viewers on Zoom today um, for this seminar, which is awesome. I think this is like one of our highest participation events. So thanks for being here today. We have many others joining us on Zoom. So probably our numbers are more like 150. A couple of reminders. Don't forget about that free review that we talked about. Um, we spent some time today talking about amendments to CCNRs. Don't forget that our firm offers the um, free 15-minute review of your CCNRs, bylaws, or articles, and send me an email with the document that you want me to review, and give us a couple of weeks to review it, and then we'll get it back to you at no charge with um, our suggestions on the amendment, what it takes to amend um, your documents, what percentage, and then an estimate as to how much it costs to amend the documents. That's a really great free service that we're doing, and I encourage you to take advantage of it. The next thing I want to remind you of is that we have our next virtual First Friday free call-in on Friday, August 4th at 9 a.m. We do this every month and I get online on Zoom and Facebook Live and answer your questions for free. We just ask that it's just one question per association and you can submit your questions through 8.45 a.m. on Friday, August 4th. And you can find out more information on this um, on by contacting uh, me by email or um, by um, contacting our office at 602-241-1093 um, or signing up to receive our Mulcahy memos, which we send out every week with important information on associations. Okay, next we have our August class for our HOA Condo Virtual HOA Academy, and that's going to be on Tuesday, August 15th. 2023. The topic for this class is going to be thoughtful hiring avoids firing. In this class, we're going to talk about management companies and how to select a management company um, and the important role of the community manager and how to work well with man vendors, whether it's your management company or your landscaping company, how to handle disputes with your vendors. And so we're going to kind of all things vendors. We're going to talk about how to hire them and make good choices. How do you deal with them if you have problems? How do you fire them? How do you find a new one? And so we've got a lot of great topics for that Tuesday, August 15th class um, of our virtual HOA Condo Academy. Last but not least, it's so important for me to receive feedback as to how we can improve on these classes or if we're doing a good job. Um, and so I'm asking you, please take some time today right after this class, do it now. I'm a do it now person. Please consider leaving our firm a Google review. We're going to be sharing a link in the chat on how to leave a review. We are always happy to get feedback from our anybody who's listening to us here today, participating, and also from our clients about how we can continue to improve our service and how we can continue to um, provide good education and practical education for you. 
Um, the only way I'm getting feedback is if you put something on Google for me and we'll, we read every single one. So I'm encouraging you please to do that um, to help us out. Thank you again, everybody, for being here today. We appreciate you caring about your communities and wanting to make them better. And um, I hope you have a great rest of the month. Stay cool as the temperatures get up there. Stay hydrated. And we look forward to seeing you for our classes in August. Take care, everybody. Bye. Don't forget, our free cheat sheets are available for download at mulcahylawfirm.com. They attend our Zoom, Facebook Live, First Friday free call-in, videos, and podcasts is to provide a forum for board members and community managers to receive answers to HOA and condo legal questions. Please note, the content in these sessions are general in nature and is not intended to and should not be relied upon or construed as legal opinion or legal advice regarding any specific issue or factual circumstance. You should directly consult with an attorney for advice regarding your individual situation.